A very warm welcome to our future framing session that is co-hosted by UNDP together with us here at EY. I welcome you on behalf of my co-host Achim Steiner, the UNDP's administrator. You can see him here. It's a virtual session, New York, Berlin, many other places in the world. It's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I will also introduce you later to my uh, colleague Nadim, who will lead you through the second half of the event uh, later today. Over the course of the next three days, we welcome you to our journey around the world and to tune in to our events virtually anchored here in Berlin, where I'm currently standing in our so-called wave space. That's our own studio here, with the famous place taking place in Dubai in the next days and in San Francisco. My name is Bernard Lawrence. I'm a partner here in EY, Germany. And among other duties, I have the special uh, pleasure to, um, uh, to lead our strategic partnership with UNTP, which is really a blow, both a pleasure and a privilege to work not only with Achim Steiner, but with also many colleagues of him, him at UNDP. The discussions we will have in the three sessions are intended to feed into the main Istanbul Innovation Day session a week from now. And in each of these um, um, uh, locations worldwide, UNDP and EY have invited experts to speak about the future of green economies, of knowledge and of technology partnerships. Today's session here in Berlin, we explore green economies and innovation, particularly with regard to public policy, policy innovation, so to say. We will speak about policy innovation for the green transformation and about the major question that is a big question in political Berlin, as it is globally at the moment. How can we manage this great transformation to a low carbon economy, to a low carbon society? How can we manage this great transformation? I always refer to the word great transformation. Karl Polanyi's famous book of 1944 is something that we always have in mind if we speak about transformational logic. Tomorrow in Dubai, of course, we will together with UNDP explore the future of knowledge. We will set out how to accelerate the future of knowledge to create sustainable resilience where my um, dear friend, colleague and of course boss Julie Teekland will open the session together with Khaled Abdel Shafi, um, UNDP's director of the regional hub in Amman. Finally, our third session this week will be in San Francisco. It explores technology partnerships. Of course, San Francisco, it's all about technology, technology partnerships. There on Thursday, we will discuss how technology partnerships may empower us to transition towards a greener, more inclusive economy and economies and transform development. Here, Adlai Goldberg, one of my dear colleagues and partners in the US, and the UNDP's Chief Digital Officer, Robert Opp, will open our final session. Before we now officially kick off today's program, I would like to highlight um, a remark calling the following functionality. All you participants tuning into the sessions are able to use the chat function where they, you can leave questions and comments for our speakers that will be answered over the course of the session. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear later panelists, my dear co-host Achim, the theme of today launches on how we can explore new policies, new regulations in managing the major transformation ahead of us. A question that we discuss with both corporate actors in the corporate world, but we also discuss, of course, in the public policy field. And we discuss it, we discuss it today in particular with regard to the, to the developing regions that is our special interest, of course, with our partners of UNDP. I have now the privilege and pleasure to welcome Jochen Flassbart, the Secretary of State, of course, here in Berlin at the Federal Ministry of Environmental, a dear friend and colleague who will welcome us to this special day. Jochen, over to you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be part of this future framing session in Berlin as you prepare for the Istanbul Innovation Day. The pandemic has shaken virtually all aspects of our societies and has shown us how important it is to innovate and to rethink so that our societies and economies become much more resilient. As we are trying to overcome the consequences of the pandemic, we as governments are faced with a choice. We can maintain existing economic and social structures with traditional economic recovery plans, or we can rethink, innovate and ultimately invest in a sustainable and inclusive future. 
The stimulus packages in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic create an unprecedented opportunity to accelerate social and environmental transformation. They can help our societies emerge from the COVID crisis in a more sustainable and resilient way. After all, the current pandemic clearly highlights the link between nature conservation and the protection of human well-being. In order to mitigate the risk of future pandemics, we need to conserve biodiversity and protect ecosystems more effectively. We can only be healthy if the environment as a whole is healthy. These considerations have prompted us to design the German Economic Recovery Package to accelerate the transition to a climate-neutral and environmentally friendly, sustainable future and invest in ecological modernization. For example, we are making investments in advancing electric mobility and promoting the production and usage of green hydrogen. I'm also very pleased that in Germany and the EU we have decided to be climate neutral by 2050. Last December, in the midst of the pandemic, EU leaders also decided to raise the ambition of the EU's 2030 climate target. By 2030, we plan to lower our carbon dioxide emissions by at least 55% compared to 1990 levels. Under Germany's Council Presidency, we worked hard to ensure that the EU's COVID economic recovery package, as well as the multi-annual financial framework, are aligned with the objectives of the European Green Deal. It is essential that the mobilized public funds are directed towards greener and carbon-neutral societies. And in the spirit of the 2030 agenda, it is of utmost importance to also include the social dimension and to work towards social inclusive and just solutions. Funds channeled towards structural change and just transition are necessary and worthwhile investments in a prosperous future and to strengthen social cohesion. I strongly believe that the current threats to human health and the economy should be addressed through multilateral action. Of course, the COVID-19 crisis hits hardest where resilience is lowest. Not all countries have the necessary financial flexibility to launch their own economic recovery plans. This is why Germany supports its partner countries as part of my ministry International Climate Initiative. We support, for example, immediate action to protect threatened nature reserves and indigenous groups. We also help countries to emerge from the crisis more sustainable and resilient. Last year, my ministry has committed additional funds of 68 million euros to facilitate this work. We also support the re green recovery activities of the UN PAGE Alliance and the NDC Partnership and welcome the strong interagency work of these partnerships. The present COVID-19 and the climate crisis cannot be solved by one country or one company alone. It is crucial that the international community pulls in the same direction and leverages existing knowledge as well as expertise. We have to make better use of the innovative strengths of private companies, startups, think tanks, universities and NGOs. The experience with the rather fast development of new vaccines is striking. We have to make use of such innovation capabilities much more to fight climate change and to protect nature and biodiversity. In this context, I very much welcome the work of UNDP and others on digital solutions for sustainable development. Dear participants, for today's session, I wish you all the best and hope for fruitful discussions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. State Secretary, lieber Jochen, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to have you on board and know your support and your, um, I think, managing those questions on the political arena, particularly here in Germany, but also with regard to the COP and the fall. Thank you very much for your thoughtful remarks as always. I have now both the pleasure and pleasure means really pleasure and honor to welcome a dear friend and colleague and distinguished of course administrator of the UNDP, a public political, a public intellectual in his own right, Achim Steiner, who is really dominating many of the discourses that we will tackle today. It's always a pleasure to listen to him, administrator of UNDP, Achim Steiner, Dear Achim, the floor is yours. Please give us your opening speech. Bernard, thank you for this kind introduction and let me also begin by thanking EY and you and the teams that have worked together in putting these future framing sessions together. You have already outlined three events, I think fascinating opportunities to get a glimpse of the future and they really fit perfectly into the Istanbul Innovation Days that UNDP organizes every year to look at development not as it is, 
but as it could be. And to do so with people, with professionals, with uh, pioneers, explorers, if you want, of the frontiers of development, where really the opportunities that come from learning from the past, looking to the future in terms of technological possibilities, new knowledge networks, new platforms on which we can interact. And so the Istanbul Innovation Days are for us an opportunity to reflect, to engage, to learn, and quickly to translate these insights back into what UNDP does every day across the world in 170 countries, which is to connect, to connect practitioners, to connect policy innovation, to try and bring a perspective to development that is crucial in trying to address precisely, Bernard, what you said, transformation. We live in an age of transformation, and today's theme, green economies and innovation, certainly is not only something that has been maturing for a number of years, if not decades, it is now an imperative. As we look forward, let me also note that just a few weeks ago, UNDP published the 2020 Human Development Report, and it looked at this from the perspective of the next frontier, human development and the Anthropocene. We live in an age where transformation is truly an imperative for human well-being as much as planetary sustainability, and it happens in the context also of a moment in time, unlike any that I think any of us have lived through today, the pandemic, COVID-19. We live in a moment in time where COVID-19 and the pandemic has also given us another reason to try and better understand how it is that humans are transforming this planet. The notion of the Anthropocene, where the human species is becoming the dominant player on the planet, and all the changes that it has brought with it, are now the focus of our attention. Development choices is essentially about understanding what we have created, but also where we must make different choices in the future. Development and the development discourse in the Istanbul Innovation Days is going to touch on many aspects, but today the green economy and innovation is the focus of our work. And I would just like to pick three areas in which I believe these could be crucial drivers of what happens next. One is the whole world of finance. As we look at the financial markets, as we look at our economies, and we recognize both the inability of financial markets, but also of players in industry and the technology sectors to rapidly be able to mainstream the kind of transformations that are needed to address, for instance, climate change, the loss of biodiversity, but all the incipient phenomena of inequality that is escalating in so many societies, we clearly have a major task ahead of us in which innovation is going to be a driving principle. Nobody wants to contest the fact that it is in the wealth of the world of today, largely held in private hands, financial institutions, pension funds, people who save their money, lies the opportunity to invest in that transformation, that transition. How do we, through regulatory and incentive and public policies, create a momentum that facilitates a scaled up and accelerated investment in these new future pathways? UNDP, together with our sister agency, UNEP, works very closely with financial sector institutions, financial policymakers. I represent the United Nations in the G20 track of finance ministers and central bank governors. And there we currently see the reestablishment of the Sustainable Finance Study Group. <clears throat> Precisely to look with ministers of finance and central bank governors, how does a regulatory framework accelerate the ability of economies and societies to invest in a green economy transition? often portrayed as an additional expenditure, when really, in truth, it is about redirecting, repurposing the current expenditure tracks that are already laid out for our infrastructure, be it in energy, transport, uh, buildings, and others. Let me quickly turn to energy. Again, a crucial sector in terms of decarbonizing our economies. Clearly, the low carbon future of our societies and economies is now a given. The question is, how slow are we in our ability to respond? Can we make energy transitions happen faster? What are the innovation models that allow not only national grids to function, but also for, for instance, in a continent like Africa, where to this day, 600 million people do not have access to electricity. So the combination of a development objective, access to electricity, plus a transition towards a low carbon energy future needs to be jump-started. This is where we need new partnerships, new policies, new financing mechanisms, and also an understanding that there is an 
inexplicable reluctance at the moment to recognize how interdependent we are in this endeavor. The international community must rise to the challenge of, for instance, recognizing that Africa's energy future is as much about how citizens on the continent will have access to electricity as it is about the carbon footprint of a world population of soon 8 billion people. A third area, technology and digitalization, and it is an area in which EY and UNDP have worked very closely together when we developed the first digital strategy of UNDP, recognizing the potential for transformation of digitalization, but also the risks that come with it, recognizing that digitalization is not just about the next technology, the next app, the next software, but about an ecosystem that we create for digitalization in which we address inequality and access and opportunity with equal attention to the entrepreneurial and commercial opportunities that arise. Shaping those ecosystems will in part define whether our societies can leverage a technology that keeps us together rather than falling apart. So I mention this because, and I end with this, a green economy and innovation agenda is not just about green things. It is about the societies we want to live in. It's about the economies that we need in order to succeed. It's about transformation at a challenging and very disruptive moment in time, namely COVID-19, climate change staring at us with the clock ticking, and essentially our ability to act as a community of nations across the world. That is UNDP's commitment as part of the United Nations support to the global family of nations. It is where we need to rethink development in the future and indeed in the present. And that is, I hope, where our future framing sessions as part of the Istanbul Innovation Days will provide new impulse, new insights, new partnerships. And again, Bernard, thank you to you and your team. It's been a real pleasure in uh, curating and crafting these uh, framing sessions together with you. Back to you. And oh, I should also mention one more thing, if you allow me, since Jochen uh, Flasper, the State Secretary of the Environment in, in Germany, just addressed us as well. A partnership such as Germany and uh, the collaboration with UNDP has very much been at the forefront of also enabling a multilateral organization like UNDP to go through its own transformation. This is what we are doing right now with our strategic plan, with our climate promise, with our work on green economy recovery, but also addressing the link between crisis management in a COVID moment and a view that ultimately the way forward has to be a different development pathway. That partnership with Germany its trust and confidence, enabling us, for instance, to establish over 90 accelerator labs across the world that look at the future of development differently in each country's context. These are the investments that will also make UNDP a 21st century organization as part of the UN's development promise to countries across the world. So I just want to end with that uh, note of gratitude also and uh, back to you, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Administrator. Thank you very much, Achim. That was a very interesting uh, kickoff for what will be a lively discussion in the next two hours. Um, you referred many times uh, to both the UN Development, uh, UNDP Human Development Report and to the area of Anthropocene in this. And I had a look into this in the last days when it came out and um, I, I liked your reference to both the transformation of industry sectors such as energy and the role that digitalization and technology can play there but also to this kind of uh, to the to the interdependence between mature economies and the developing uh, regions if you look at this year this will certainly be an absolutely decisive year for this development that you're describing with china running into the 14 5 year plan with the new us new us administration with the green um, deal in Europe with a new government possibly in Germany, but mainly, of course, the COP26 in November. If you look at COP26 and the process running up to the COP, are you expecting that this will be a next major step forward in this direction? Absolutely. And some people are justified in bringing a degree of skepticism to it, both in terms of perhaps the past track records, whenever we saw opportunities for a pivoting forward, we could not always achieve that because we are a complex human family of so many different realities, nations. But frankly speaking, I think um, Glasgow is a moment in which people have spoken across the world. They are looking for committed action, 
transparency and the ability to, you know, respond to the science of climate change, which is threatening our livelihoods across the globe. And let us also remember, you just mentioned interdependence. We have a common agenda. It's called the 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals. They were adopted in 2015 by all countries across the globe. And yes, the pandemic has been a major setback. But let us look carefully. We are now in March 2021. Would we have expected just 12 months ago before the pandemic had really set in that we would now be discussing a net zero alliance of nations across the world, having trillion dollar packages that are advancing and accelerating investment in green technologies, including addressing the climate change challenge. We are further along where we would need to be, but still far from where we have to be at this very moment than we were just a year ago. So setbacks from COVID-19 are dramatic, particularly in terms of extreme poverty, disruption, but the sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement, these are the compass with which we need to navigate out of this crisis. And therefore, I do believe that we will see in Glasgow a fundamental stress test of the Paris Agreement, namely if countries with their national strategies are willing to increase their levels of ambition. That is one inbuilt test that makes the Paris Agreement both dynamic, flexible, and ultimately capable of bringing the world together and accelerating its climate efforts. Much. I, I couldn't agree more. I have a, one second thought that came to me with regard to the title of our session discussing policy innovations, innovations in policy making, in public policy. If we look at the similarity between the COVID crisis, if you want so, and the climate crisis, there's a lot of talk, at least in Berlin and Brussels, as far as I can read it, about the similarity in terms of the role of science. And I think if we look ahead in the discussion around COP and preparing really this great transformation, explaining and convincing citizens about the need to change, the need to think about a different perspective on growth and economies and sectors and industries, I think this is a big learning from COVID. Would you share this thought? Absolutely. And I think in part we are living through an age and the Anthropocene is also a, another metaphor for this where on the one hand we are fascinated by this notion of what technology and science enables us to do. And much of the 20th century really was a journey, a, a civilizational, let's say, paradigm where humans somehow thought they could, you know, divorce themselves from nature and from the planet. It was the escape from you know, the vagaries of nature for thousands of years, floods, droughts, um, disease, made us very vulnerable. Science and technology, including, you know, putting people on the moon and, and uh, rovers on Mars, gives us that sense that perhaps we can live independent of nature. And I think right now, what we are finding is that it is with technology and science that we can better understand of how to live with nature. Humanity, human development, human security, divorced from also a sustainable planet is simply illusory. And the difficulty we face right now is that we have been too hesitant. We have waited too long. We now have disruptions. We must move forward very quickly. We are almost in a default mode by now because circumstances are forcing us to act. This is why a green recovery, a green economy, innovation, enable us to do this transformation by design rather than by default. It is always a cheaper, more effective and less disruptive way in which to do what we are perfectly capable of doing, reinventing our economy for the 21st century, working with a nature-based understanding of development in the future in which technology, science, all these extraordinary opportunities that lie ahead of us are transformative, but not divorced from life on, on planet Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Achim. Thank you, New York. Thank you, Administrator of the UNDP. It's a pleasure always to talk to you and I'm very much looking for the rest of the conversation with Mirjana and other dear colleagues of yours. Thank you very much. Bernard, thank you very much and thank you for all the support that your team has also given us. It's a great pleasure to co-host these future framing sessions and I wish you all very interesting discussions in the weeks to come. Thank you. Distinguished uh, panelists, uh, dear guests, now after this great introductory remark and the conversation I had with the administrator Achim Steiner, my co-host here in this session, co-hosted by UNDP and EY, I now have the privilege to introduce a wonderful and really distinguished panel 
with colleagues both from the public policy field, from multilateral organizations, as from the state here in Germany and private actors who discuss one of the key questions that we are addressing in the next days in this Istanbul Innovation Day. So the key question is how can public policy play an innovative role in ensuring a just transition into a future green economy. A future green economy, we've, speaken, we've spoken and we have heard from both State Secretary Jochen Flassbart and Achim Steiner about this great transformation with respect to uh, Polanyi's famous book, the question how we can transform both our economies and societies, both in the mature and in the developing regions, to this new um, low-carbon uh, future, both societies and economies, and we have heard about the great challenge that is ahead of us. I have the privilege to introduce um, my uh, panel now with, first of all, Mirjana um, Egger. Mirjana is the Assistant Administrator and Director of UNDP's Regional Bureau for Europe and the Commonwealth of Independent States, who is, of course, co-organized uh, this event with us. Um, welcoming Mirjana is a, 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 quite a challenge because she has a distinguished career um, as a diplomat. Um, before she served um, as the Assistant Secretary General at UNDP, she has served as an ambassador at head of the United Nations and International Organizations Division of the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, um, the, fa the famous EDA, and, um, and has been instrumental in shaping Swiss UN policies and priorities in focusing on the achievements on the 2030 Agenda, welcoming Mirjana. Um, I also welcome the Secretary of State here in Berlin and the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, Martin Jäger. Martin Jäger has been, prior to his role as the State Secretary, uh, served in multiple German federal and regional ministries, which gives him a wide range of insights. Martin is not only a State Secretary, really um, uh, having a very, very clear view on both UNDP and other agencies in the field, but also really a thought leader in the Berlin scene and arena among think tanks, universities, discussing all aspects of developing regions. I also have the privilege to introduce and welcome with you together Veronika Scotti, the Chairperson of Public Sectors Solutions at Swiss Re. She has been with Swiss Re for more than 20 years and is a former president and CEO of Swiss Re Canada and English Caribbean. She gained expensive, extensive experience in investment banking prior, of course, to Swiss Re as well. Welcome, Veronica. And last but not least, and this is also my first um, panelist I will address a question to, Beata Javoschik, the chief economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and uh, also a distinguished academic position in career. She holds, uh, Beata holds a position as a statutory professorship in economics at the University of Oxford and is a fellow of All Souls College. Welcome, uh, Beata. Beata, with regard to our question today, or maybe before I uh, ask you a question, let me um, address one more technical aspect to all our listeners and panelists. If you have comments on the topic, please insert them below in the Q&A tool um, um, or, or the chat function so that we can maybe later address these questions and follow up with them. But now, Beata, to you and uh, your role. How would you, with the overall view on the whole um, area and field, how would you prioritize smart regulations, as I like to call them? Pop, I mean, Mirjana refers to them as as innovative policies, I would say smart regulations for a green and inclusive economy, in particular keeping in mind the context of development and transition economies. Please, Beata, the floor is yours. Well, I think there are lots of things governments can do in the short, in the medium and in the long run. I think in the short run, uh, as we enter the recovery stage from the pandemic, governments should prioritize activities that are both labor intensive, so job creating, and green. So examples of such activities include retrofitting of public building, improving insulation of residential buildings. Actually, there is a lot to be done in this area in Europe as well as um, in emerging markets. In the medium term, um, we need to break information barriers. In a survey the EBRD did a couple of years ago, when we asked firms 
why haven't you engaged in energy saving investments? Almost two thirds of firms in emerging markets said it's simply not a priority for us. So in many cases, firms simply do not realize the potential benefits um, such investments could bring. They simply think about uh, the initial expense they need to bear. Interestingly, lack of access to credit was, was cited as the reason by only 12% of firms. So there is a lot governments can do by nudging firms towards energy audits, perhaps even subsidizing such audits, so that firms realize the potential benefits. And then, of course, there is the issue of uh, access to financing, um, so that firms that realize the benefits can actually um, reap these benefits by investment. And then in the long run, um, governments need to allow this creative destruction to happen. Um, I think they need to accept the fact that moving to a net zero future means huge structural changes in the economy. So we should not be artificially keeping zombie firms alive, firms that have no future in the green in our green economy, in our net zero economy. And of course, the huge area for government action is subsidizing R&D investment. So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Very thoughtful remarks at the starting point. And I would like to give the floor and take really one of the points that you're making, um, Beata, to, to Martin Jäger. Martin, the role of public policy will be a crucial one in this great transformation, of course. But Beata just referred to the investment side. We know with regard to the great transformation that we are in a certain investment cycle at the very moment. Beata made the example of energy audits. She made the example of heat pumps as a major solution into, invest, into, into buildings here, also in the mature economies. How do you see and regard the role of public policies of innovative policy making for tackling climate change? And what are your expectations with regard to the private side and to, to investors? Yeah, thank you, Bernard. Uh, I, uh, thank you for having me here and uh, thank you, Beata. Uh, the, the outline you gave is, is something I would uh, fully subscribe to. So that's very close to our thinking. Uh, however, when I, I, I look at the title of our panel, uh, uh, play an innovative role in ensuring a just transition, uh, for us and, and our focus is uh, the cooperation with uh, developing countries, uh, the, the, the current issue is, is uh, still more uh, that we are preoccupied with crisis management that we, we try to mitigate the, the shocks and impacts of, of this COVID pandemic. And uh, it, is, it is not easy for policymakers uh, to look uh, beyond the, the current needs and our day-by-day -day business. And uh, the, the whole debate about building back better um, is is an ambiguous one uh, because uh, as, as I experience it and uh, I, I think that is a perception that is shared by many uh, policy makers is uh, we we are struggling with uh, getting back to to some growth uh, we we hope to to reactivate the economy and uh, having a substantial uh, and, and uh, strategic debate on, on how to transform uh, the economy at the same time, that's a challenge. Uh, that's our mission. We are fully dedicated to that. But uh, let me put it that way. We are surrounded by people uh, who think uh, surviving the day is more important and uh, thinking about uh, transformation, thinking about reshaping, restructuring whole economies. Uh, yeah, that's important, but uh, it's nothing we should uh, take uh, care about now. So uh, first, uh, we are uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in an intensive debate with these people. 
and uh, we we need to convince them. Uh, and uh, this is not only a debate among uh, policymakers. Uh, it is also a debate we are having with uh, private investors, because uh, of course uh, it's uh, the the responsibility of governments of policymakers. Uh, to make sure that there are uh, public funds available uh, to uh, initiate these kind of, of transformations uh, we are talking about. But uh, one thing is clear, even a government uh, as, as the German one uh, that uh, mobilized more than 10 billion euros just to to, to, to help and support our uh, partner countries, uh, developing uh, countries and uh, middle income countries. Uh, e even a, a country like, uh, like ours uh, is, is not in a position uh, to deal with these challenges, meaning we need uh, additional uh, private uh, capital and uh, if you, you uh, take as, as a point of departure uh, an assumption done by the United Nations that the annual uh, gap, uh, financing gap, uh, we need to achieve the, the SDGs uh, is at about, around about $2.5 trillion a year. And uh, considering the fact that uh, 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 official de development assistance uh, is uh, on an annual basis is not more than 150 billion uh, dollars you see that there is a huge huge gap and this is why uh, when we talk in my ministry about uh, transforming our economies uh, when we talk about green recovery uh, recovering forward uh, we we are uh, focusing on how to bring in uh, private capital. Uh, we have been uh, rather successful uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, for example, uh, in 2019, uh, we, we uh, mobilized $656 million uh, uh, of blended finance from non-state actors, but compared to the needs, uh, that's not enough. And this is why I, I would like to have a, a, a more uh, targeted di discussion uh, in, 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 in our field about how to engage non-state actors and, and private investors, uh, how to bring them in. And uh, Beata uh, just made a an, an very important point. It's not a lack of credit. That, that's absolutely true. When we talk uh, about developing countries, uh, it's uh, 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 a lack of bankable projects and it's about uh, risk sharing. Who is going to take the risks? And here I see a more expanded role for governments as it has been in the future. Uh, this is one of the big uh, challenges ahead to define and find, create the instruments that brings, bring in uh, private capital uh, under the uh, auspices and with the support of uh, government money. So for that as a start, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. State Secretary. Very interesting remarks, really following Beata's strong point. Um, I think there are certain roles for governments, for public sector actors and for private actors and about those roles and the models to run those roles and the question how to cooperate. That will certainly be something we would like to come back later in the discussion, maybe with some very concrete examples. But now um, we have a private actor here, Veronica, uh, with regard to the uh, insurance industry or the reinsurance industry making an impact on this uh, question of innovative um, policy making in the field of climate challenge and particularly on the development of, um, of, of a just transition. What, how would you describe the role of your industry and the potential of the industry, particularly with respect to what the State Secretary just said uh, with regard to possible cooperation? Please. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bernard, and uh, thank you for having me. And I really want to build on what the State uh, Secretary Yeager has just uh, contributed as his thought. Um, and, and on two accounts. The first is um, he's, uh, he's absolutely right. COVID has our attention out of necessity at this moment in time, and um, we cannot not have uh, uh, that in mind. But uh, the climate change is a very systemic risk that we're facing, existential uh, to the same extent, and we actually have run out of time. So if I can offer a thought and a, a line of argument that I would use is um, if we took the actions that we're discussing now back in 1983, when we all were still alive and, and already starting to get active in the workplace, um, we would actually be on a much faster, clearer track to achieving the Par Paris goals. Uh, the reality is that the stock of the carbon footprint that we put in the atmosphere has really built dramatically in the last 40 years. So every year that goes by is a non-linear contribution and it really aggravates uh, the situation for us to the point of no return. So uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit alarmist, I really look at 2021 as a year where we can take critical decisions that really change the course of how bad it's going to get. Uh, but there has to be a recognition that a lot of what we've done to nature, to our own environment, is at some level not short-term reversible. But we have to act with absolute urgency and we can do a number of things and maybe so to articulate my thoughts of what we can do and how policies can really make a huge difference. Um, I'll use the example of what my company is doing just because I'm very familiar with our policies, but I know we're not alone. Uh, we've embraced the net zero. Uh, commitment as many, many companies, um, I think a fifth of the companies around the world have done that already. And we've committed to embed sustainability across all we do uh, between our footprint, direct footprint by 2030, and then our full decarbonization of our activities by 2050. So I want to articulate the four pillars that underpin our conversion, our transformation strategy, because I believe um, that those are applicable across all sectors of the economy. So first of all, we should reduce our emissions and decarbonize. So this isn't just about, um, you know, some future prospect, prospect is about really the absolute contribution that we make each and every year has to go down. And that's around circular economy, energy efficiency, energy mix, as Beata was talking about, but really value chain adjustments. That is what allows us to transition to a low carbon economy where our absolute footprint is smaller. And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, a first priority. The second one is around carbon removal. And to that, I would say we can use both nature-based and industrial-based approaches. And so when we look at the nature-based sequestration, this is uh, allowing the planet to heal itself and giving value to the way nature protects us and, and absorbs some of that emission that is already in the atmosphere. When we're looking at the industrial approach, we're really talking about carbon sequestration. And that carbon sequestration industry doesn't exist today. It's very expensive experimental and needs to be expanded and supported. But then last and the fourth pillar is about uh, accepting uh, that we need to prevent and minimize the climate shocks, the climate damages that are going to come either ways. And that's about climate adaptation. And, uh, and so we are going to live with um, higher temperatures. We're going to live with much more um, volatility uh, between droughts and, and sea level rising and flooding. And therefore, how we, we build, we, we construct going forward, what we do with our existing stock of physical assets, how we adapt our infrastructures, how we take care of the health implications, all of these considerations need, uh, need very explicit adaptation. Uh, strategies. And if you allow me, Bernard, I'd like to just give two or three examples of how policies, since we have a policy panel today, how policies can really make a big difference. Because this is the framework that I, I use in, in promoving the activity within my team and within the organization. Under pillar one, the decarbonization, uh, what we need to do is stop what is bad. Right. So you may know we're members of the Asset Owner Alliance that, that um, comprises of five trillion of invested capital by um, a number of long term capital providers. And in November last year, we called for cancellation of new thermal coal uh, projects. We just, simply we should stop doing things that we know just harm us. 
The second thing is, is redesigning the incentives that allow us to change the carbon footprint at a system level. And there I want to just call out some really interesting work that was done by the uh, World Economic Forum in collaboration with BCG, the IBC, and the, an initiative where we're active that is the CEO Climate Leaders. And in that study, entire sectors were studied end to end the entire value chain. And what you realize is that the cost of getting to net zero across the value chain is anything between four and 8%. That is completely digestible in our economies, but it's not equally distributed. So we need to find incentive and mechanisms that allow us to support that carbon decarbonization across. And, and for that, we really need task forces. And um, for instance, one thing that we're doing uh, together with other sector uh, participants is in the context of the European Green Deal Action Group, we're looking at a farm to fork transformation pilot in Europe, because we, we believe, uh, it's a bit where Beata was going, great potential, great need for food, quality food, but we need to produce differently. We need to innovate. We need to create incentives, less subsidies, more incentives. We need transparency. So that that entire value chain needs transformation. We need to be able to provide protection for this heightened risk as we transition to a different way of producing. Uh, the next um, the next observation is about the transparency of the methodologies and comparabilities. So as we all make efforts to reduce our own carbon footprint, and last but not least, I, there is this point of investing at scale. Um, and uh, again, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, fantastic examples from Europe around um, photovoltaic, uh, solar and, and wind, where European uh, leaders created future pricing. Uh, but we need to do the same now for hydrogen. We need to do for ammonia. We need to do it for industry that don't exist again yet at the moment, uh, like direct carbon, carbon capture. Uh, I can cover the other pillars later. Bernard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. It's a pleasure to work with you because I don't have to ask questions. I just give you this one word and you start working. It's very interesting points. I really like uh, both your, your summarizing points, the, the question of a framework that we need from policymakers and that the perfect uh, uh, starting point for Mariana maybe, and also the question of scaling and redesigning incentives and scaling, of course, technologies like hydrogen. As we German, I think always uh, we can argue, Martin, designed the world of, of, of renewables, right? And financed it finally also um, um, for the sake of all of us. Um, uh, Mayana, if you hear this position from the private uh, world, looking at policymakers, asking them to give a f the right framework, the right investment framework and, and rules of the game for the next phase of decarbonization, how would you think to ensure this dialogue around the future approach that we need and to make this inclusive and of course targeted particularly to the needs of your specific regions and with regard to the regional experience that you have there. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. I hope you can hear me. And uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be part of this discussion and I really also in this combination um, of, of, you know, colleagues from, from different sectors. And, and let me just say at the outset, it's, it's not that we have different approaches or that we analyze the situation differently. I think what we have to learn in the future is how we can align and work more closely together because we all seem to be sharing the same goals. Um, speaking on behalf of UNDP, and of course I, I work in a region that has to uh, tackle you know, obsolete um, carbon and uh, nuclear, all nuclear power plant dependency. Um, I want to focus first on, on our global role as, as the largest UN development agency. And, and go back to a little bit to the basics. And uh, Veronica, you spoke about incentives and, and Beata, you spoke about incentives as well. Um, but, you know, looking at what Martin Yeager said that we are, as, as development actors and practitioners, still preoccupied with crisis management. We also have to look at, you know, how can we mitigate the negative effects, the immediate negative effects of, of turning away from, from fossil fuel subsidies. And let me therefore go back to the roots, because that's our primary role. Help the governments identify the root causes and where they should be starting from. If we look at our work in poverty reduction over the four decades um, uh, behind us, we've done great progress. 
but all economies in the same time have witnessed inequalities and related social tensions. And for the first time, of course, due to COVID, since 1990, when uh, UNDP started measuring human development, the human development index is regressing. And this is even worse when we add the planetary pressures, as you can see from the 30th report on the Anthropocene. And right now, half of the world's population is struggling to make ends meet without unemployment benefits and without health care. Now, against this background, at the centerpiece of UNDP support to governments is the principle of leaving no one behind. Because in order to achieve just tran transition towards green and inclusive recovery, we have to do several things and keep several things in mind simultaneously. I will mention just four. Sustainability and equity are intrinsically linked together. Environmental and health consequences of climate change predominantly and disproportionately impact the poorest countries, but also the poor people in middle income and high income countries. So nobody is excluded from this debate and the majority of the poor people still live in middle income countries. So we have to tackle those who are overrepresented in the higher risk area so that they can cope with the transitions that are necessary, which are women, which are minorities, which are local populations, and especially people living in remote, remote areas away from the cities. And secondly, and linked to the same issue, we have to tackle informality. 1.6 billion people today make, make their living without any social protection. So we have to look at SMEs, we have to look at micro businesses, we have to support frontline workers, as, as we have seen, and we have to tackle the issue of unpaid work. And here again, we have to look at empowering women and bringing women into the formal labor market. Thirdly, we have to accelerate access to sustainable energy. 400 million students last year missed school because they didn't have access to energy and internet for remote learning. We are working on the mini grids program in Africa, trying to help governments invest in policy making and institutional strengthening so that we can invest um, or attract investments in on grid and uh, off grid areas. And last but not least, and I'm saying this not because technology will solve all the problems of humanity, but as the administrator said, digital has to happen in all areas and we have to close the digital divide in all areas. And because the digital divide affects again the same groups, the women, the poor, the elderly, the rural, um, the local, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have to do is we have to look at ecosystems that allow everybody to equally benefit from the technological advancements that, that are happening and that we invest in the right technology. Now, what we are seeing, and we are looking at trillions here in the country where I live, trillions currently being pumped into the economic cycle. I'm not criticizing anything, but if we have trillions to put into the economic system to cope with COVID, how about putting it in a way so it helps us closing some of these gaps going forward. Thank you, Bernard. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mariana. I would like to play the ball, um, Mr. State Secretary, in your direction, because there were two big references. I think you have to say something. One is, of course, digital. You invested a lot into UNDP's digital investments um, with regard particular to the SDG Accelerator Labs, which is, in my view, in many regards, a public-private partnership in itself, and then a lab where you where you kind of bring innovative solutions both from the public and the private side together. So digital is certainly something that is key on your agenda. Also, as somebody who pushes GIZ, the other entity uh, that you are supporting a lot in this direction in your in your function as the chairperson there of the board, but also the question of um, of sustainability as such, and the question how to incentivize. The, uh, the, the, the private sector more in going in the right direction. I always say um, with regard to this transformation ahead of us, great transformation is a challenge for all and I think that uh, strong regulations make strong companies. 
So if we talk about incentivize um, private sector investments in the right direction, what is your experience? How, do you have some concrete examples that we can use for this discussion here? Let me first of all align myself with uh, what Mirjana just said. Uh, the digital divide is a threat and a huge challenge. Um, and one of the tools uh, we invested in uh, to cope with that uh, are the accelerator labs. That is probably the most innovative uh, project uh, I, uh, I've seen over the past uh, three years. Uh, I was uh, happy to join the administrator uh, and to support Achim uh, in setting up uh, these. Uh, this is not only one project. There are many projects in, in, in many countries. And uh, the, 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 the network uh, that uh, came into existence uh, after setting up these labs in, in, in specific countries is impressive. And uh, now we are starting, and that's the right time, uh, we are starting to have the, the first fruits of uh, these efforts. So uh, I think uh, the, the approach taken by UNDP proves to be the right one. And uh, that will be of tremendous uh, support uh, uh, to our our ongoing uh, efforts. Um, let, let me just one more because that, that's that's really something I I, I must comment. Uh, uh, let me add a word to what uh, Veronica said about uh, uh, how to tackle the climate change. And uh, Veronica rightly said, "Stop what is bad." That is key, of course. Uh, however, we. In, in development, we, we are uh, with partner governments uh, worldwide uh, that have currently uh, very different problems. They, they must deal with hunger, riot, hunger riots, uh, they have uh, social security systems uh, imploding and, and stuff like that. And when we talk to them and tell them, yeah, we, we understand, we support you, we, we, we help to mitigate the, the social consequences of the crisis. Uh, we, we must make uh, offers. Uh, for example, when I talk to a government about subsidizing uh, petrol or get it getting away from uh, fossil energy, uh, people there, they understand that it would be better uh, not to do these things, but what they need is, uh, alternatives and uh, financing uh, for alternatives. And, and uh, here is a, is, is a huge challenge, a challenge, and even more so if you take into account the, the fiscal situation uh, uh, of these countries, uh, which uh, often is extremely strained. Yeah? We have a debt issue uh, uh, coming up, and we have a number uh, of, of partner governments uh, who are not not far away from default. So that's the world we are in and that's the kind of, of things we have to cope with. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, uh, this is uh, 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 an easy truth or a simple truth. Uh, the, the, the political decision-making cycles we are in, in our countries, uh, is, is, uh, isn't helpful either. Yeah, we, we are having, having uh, elections this year in Germany, sometime uh, end of, of September. And uh, if, if you follow the, the current public debate in our country, it's about many things, but uh, not uh, primarily about climate change, which is wrong. That's, uh, that's uh, not the thing as it should be, but that's kind of, of the reality. Um, nevertheless, we don't stop. And uh, we, we, we try uh, to, to uh, improve the situation. And what I, I pointed out at the beginning of my, my, my first statement, we, we, we struggle very hard to bring in private investors uh, to, to, to feed the, the, the need of capital. And what we did, because Bernard, you asked 
uh, about uh, specific examples. For example, set up uh, an uh, investment fund uh, uh, together with uh, a private company, a big one. Uh, in, in that case, it was Allianz, uh, also an insurance company. Uh, and we set up a fund uh, to promote uh, small uh, and medium-sized businesses uh, in Africa. And we did that, it's a, st a structured fund, we did that by sharing the risks, meaning the federal government, uh, us, we took the bigger part of the risk and uh, Allianz is making sure that uh, enough uh, capital comes in. Uh, I, I could give you uh, a, a number of, of, of other examples, but I, I, I let it with that and back to you, Bernard. Thank you, Mr. I think, I think we all agree that we need to help people whose livelihoods have been uh, threatened by the pandemic. But the issue of short-term versus long-term trade-offs pointed out by the state secretary will always be there. There will always be given preference to short-term matters precisely because of the political cycles. So the only thing that we can do is to tie our hands to make credible commitments, preferably through international agreements that cannot be easily reversed. And that's what's going to create incentives and lead to bankable projects. And, you know, if you think about the very ambitious commitments made by Europe, which will have to result in carbon adjustment prices collected at the border, these commitments have already had an international impact. Because in emerging markets where governments are not at the forefront of green agenda, firms are already thinking about how they will be able to export to the EU when this tax comes into place. And these firms are already starting adjustment processes. So our role as an international community is to help them find financing and to engage in risk sharing, which MDBs can do. And, you know, there's also a, a flip side to the coin. You know, we keep on talking about just costs, but these international commitments create opportunities so think about country like Albania, where 97% of electricity comes from hydropower. And country, this is a country which has a lot of potential for renewables. That's a country that could become a green manufacturing hub supplying Europe. So there are ways of creating country development strategies around green commitments. Thank you. Very strong point, and, and I know that both UNDP and and the and your bank are working on those strategies for governments. And I think that MDBs can play a major role. But with regard to Veronica's point earlier, um, uh, that you said, Veronica, there's a need of urgency, and the pledge both by Mariana and the State Secretary that there is there it couldn't be enough, and we need investments. I think uh, it's all about getting the incentives right, and you made this strong point with incentives. So um, I'm a big fan by the incentives that came out of Paris as a global contract and now the European Green Deal, which you just referred to. On the way to the COP26 to Glasgow, we will see many of nationally determined uh, contribution discussions around these, the impact of these international contracts. How would this affect the, the international investment um, area and how and which role do you think, Veronica, if you look in the nearest future, will the, will the, will the, will the of course, major investors around the, the, um, the insurance companies play? And, and will there be scalable solutions? That's another thing. I mean, Martin Jäger just referred to one of the solutions that he developed with a competitor of yours, but there are many other solutions and it's about scalability, of course. Uh, is we're, this we're something that we will see more in the future of? Please go. Yes, thank you, Bernard. And uh, I think I think Miriana said it before, we're not at odds. We're just coming from different perspective and we just have to coalesce around the action. So I want to actually, I hope I'm coming across as positive. A lot is happening already. We just need a little bit of a uh, an environment. And uh, so let's take the example of Europe, the, the European uh, Adaptation Strategy Report that just came out uh, 10 days ago. It's a fantastic document. It's packed with policy recommendations 
and some of them are maybe more enforced than others and, and it recognizes that there is this point of connecting the dots that is not happening maybe enough but where we need to connect has been identified so i think for me uh, the invitation is that we use this months leading up to the cop 26 to take ownership in not just saying i commit individually but we join forces to make this happen within a given time frame. I really like what Beata talked about, you know, this firm binding commitments. So, but you invite me to talk about investments and we are not short of capital in the world. There is a lot of, of financing going about. Someone else touched upon uh, uh, before on the point of um, bankability or are this project, the pipeline of projects meeting the standards. So there are some carrots and there are some sticks. Let me start with the, uh, a small stick. I really think it's minor, but I think we can fix it. Um, the industry, the insurance industry overall is about 33 trillions of capital, represents a third of what is called the patient capital, you know, long-term investors with pension funds, sovereign funds, uh, they're 85 trillion. And then you can add some more, you get to about a hundred trillion that can be mobilized. Desperately needs long-term investments. Infrastructure, as, uh, as Martin mentioned, you know, fantastic, would be the way to go because not only is matching durations, but what it does, it creates a foundational steps for the development of certain economies economies so that they can move out of, uh, of difficult cycles. But there is a problem of country perceived country risk um, and the standards of these investments, the standard of the infrastructure that gets developed. So my carrot here is to say we need to work on different types of PPPs that bring together the multilateral development banks, these country states and investors community to um, create a very clear frameworks around specific sectors, whether it's energy, whether it's the uh, digital infrastructure that we need to develop to make sure uh, building on the local assets that we are creating the right conditions for those investments to actually be sustainable. And UNDP has done a fantastic job in, in defining uh, with us as well, you know, the principle of sustainable investments as an industry, we signed up, we've made huge strides. We need to do the same. There was a point about the perception of risk. Now we're working. Uh, it was announced last week, eight companies, Alliance included, by the way, we're eight of us globally, together with the UNEPFI that launched uh, the first uh, net zero insurance underwriting alliance. What this allows us to do is to really look at everything that we underwrite and make sure that we are overlaying um, the sustainability lens to all the other aspects that are developmental. I think these are good examples of what needs to happen, but we need a regulatory environment that allows us to do this at scale. And it's a reality today. Investing in infrastructure is one of the most expensive and one of the, uh, the most restricted asset class. So working together with the regulators to make sure that we can put more money without attracting a lot more capital will make a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Miriana, I just played over to you because there were several references to you before I then make a final quick round asking each of you what would be your first priority that you wish for in the next six months to come out of an innovative policy framework. But first of you, Mirjana. Thank you, Bernard. Um, let me go back to some of the things that have been said um, about, you know, how, how to get countries to commit. And I agree with Beata, we need firm commitments and we need firm institutional frameworks. And, and we need the Green Deal as well, I must say, especially in the region where, where I work. This is the type of initiative that can convince countries even outside Europe uh, or, or the European Union to, to commit uh, to green economy and to a green transformation. Regional inequality has been one of the most toxic forms of economic um, polarization over the past decades. And we need to ensure um, that, you know, greening doesn't remain a privilege for the wealthier countries, that, but that we bring along everybody and each and every country and people in the world. And we do see this happen uh, in spite of the fiscal constraints that Martin Jaeger mentioned. And of course, we work with governments um, that see this risk of um, debt default, that see 
um, the imminent needs to respond to, uh, to COVID uh, versus the long-term investments that would be necessary for a green or better recovery. And nevertheless, uh, governments like Uzbekistan commit to green economy. They work with us closely to transform their economy. So it is happening and we also benefit or will see the benefits of the Green Deals across the Western Balkans as this initiative uh, unfolds, hopefully also in the Eastern Partnership region. So I'm very confident that the combination of political will, um, collective resource mobilization and smart policies will help us green over and above our own immediate neighborhood. Now, what we need to do when speaking about the regulatory frameworks and, and I'm I want to come in from a very practical perspective. We need to mobilize resources, we need to join forces, we need to share intelligence. Um, and in order to be able to do that, we need to remove the institutional barriers that still exist between us, the governments, the private sector, the banks even. You know how much time we spend discussing procurement rules, discussing how we cooperate as the UN with the private sector, instead of just doing it. So we have to, when we speak about innovation, think about these very practical issues that we need to change in order to grow closer together and align our resources and capacities and expertise going forward. And, and it's also an opportunity to thank again the German government for the Accelerate Labs initiative that uh, is jointly funded by Germany and, and, and Qatar, because this is us experimenting with new types of working. And if I, if I speak about new types of working, and this is where innovation has to happen, it's in the execution that we will see whether the innovation days are yielding results. It is in turning maybe away from fundable projects towards fundable portfolios and fundable systems. It is a problem that we are still thinking in projects because projects have a beginning and an end. We, if we think about systems transformations, then maybe the log frame is not an adequate instrument for funding anymore. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mariana. That's a very interesting point, which opens up a completely new horizon for another discussion. But that's always the case if you discuss with very knowledgeable partners and colleagues. And maybe we have the time in the next two days, Mariana, on other panels during this uh, uh, prep conference for the Innovation Days, which we do also in Dubai, as you know, and in San Francisco, uh, to, to, to come along those points. I would like to have a quick last round with you, dear panelists, around the question what we really wish for should happen with regard to the main question of our panel. How uh, can public policy play an innovative role in ensuring a just, that's the point that Mariana just referred to, a just transition into a future green economy. So what's on, your, on, the, on the top priority of your agenda, agenda if you look at public policy and their innovative role, particularly with regard, of course, to what we expect to come up in Glasgow at the end of the year? Maybe we start in the order Martin Jäger first, Beata, um, 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 Mirjana and Veronica, please. Uh, there was a lot of agreement in this discussion and uh, on that basis I think we, 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 we feel the need to, to realign our activities that's that's the important thing let, let me uh, conclude by by making three uh, quick remarks uh, first uh, regulation is key I agree uh, and what we uh, further need to expand is uh, the, the leverage of European uh, regulation. That has really an impact. Uh, even a country like Germany uh, is, is not to be compared with uh, what uh, can be done at a European level. And uh, we must uh, further expand that. Second, MDBs, key, uh, absolutely. Uh, and here uh, we must link uh, lending and policy making with precise uh, climate change and sustainability goals. This is uh, what we are going for when we uh, will have the World Bank Spring Meeting yeah, and the IMF Spring Meeting. This will be one of the issues and policy proposals uh, we will make. Uh, and in that context, the context uh, we should not forget about the debt situation. Uh, 
uh, of uh, uh, many uh, development and middle income uh, countries. And third, uh, we must, uh, looking forward to uh, Glasgow and the COP, we must, uh, uh, or we will, as a ministry, we will further develop our NDC partnerships. Uh, that's important because our, our gear uh, goal is, is very clear. We want to create transformed economies that are low carbon, carbon neutral, even uh, resource efficient, and that's important, socially inclusive. We, we need uh, to adapt uh, social protection systems and we must finance them. Uh, climate change, climate protection without uh, social protection uh, won't work. We must uh, bring both things uh, together. And that's what we are going uh, to work on. And I'm happy uh, we have partners like uh, UNDP or the EBRD or strong companies like uh, Allianz or Swiss Re by our side. Uh, that makes me confident that uh, we can really make a difference uh, when we talk uh, about the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Tech Secretary. What a great invitation, Beata, to EBRD. Um, what's your take, what's your two minutes takeaway for this panel discussion, in particular with regard to the role of public policy in an innovative role? So let me just first say that at the EBRD, we have committed to making the majority of our projects green by 2025. So we think of ourselves as a green bank and are committed uh, to the net zero future. On, regarding concluding remarks, the phrase I would like to leave you with is creating predictability. We live in times of, un, of enormous uncertainty and firms un, are unwilling to invest because uncertainty is detrimental to investment. So anything we can do to lower uncertainty by creating predictable regulation, but signaling now what our regulation with respect to green issues will look in three, in five, in 10 years would be of enormous help. Thank you. Thank you, Beata. Thank you very much. We have some problems with your picture. Maybe you reload your picture. Just put off the camera and put it on again. Before I pass it to Mariana, um, Veronica, What's your key takeaway with regard to innovative policy making? So I'm going to build on Beata's point. I think, I think what, what, what I would really um, support is this idea of predictability. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. It's, it's really important the predictability, and um, and I would give a priority uh, with given the just considerations and the difficulties we're living at the moment. Uh, to anything that goes towards adaptation. So for me, we have by far too much risk that goes unaddressed ex ante at this moment, uh, whether it's climate related, that then translates into social uh, problems. And we've done some, some good exercises together with the Insurance Development Forum across a number of insurance companies, uh, BMZ and UNDP, uh, to help the most vulnerable countries out there, but it's still only 270 million that we've mobilized and we're gonna deploy in the next few years. So I would really hope that not, it's not nothing but i would really hope that we can run out of those funds very quickly right because we put all these fantastic projects in place and then we go out and invest more we have to mobilize our own capital but for that we need that framework to really be working and those commitments and the predictability of the environment in which we operate will be essential but i think uh, you know, the state secretary is right there is a genuine uh, commitment from our side to be part of the solutions with this, Mirjana, the final words to you, and then I will try to sum this up within two minutes, of course. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm capitalizing a little bit on, on having, uh, you know, listeners both from the government, the bank and uh, the private sector. Um, but I do agree with Martin Jäger. Um, we have to crack the eye find out. The MDBs play an important role. We have to find out how we can better combine technical advice with loan implementation but also capitalize on local development and, and using this experience, also working with the bank and with the private sector to push into the policy space to really make sure that laws are changed in a way they address the needs of the people. And also, you know, 
make change predictable for the people, which is more important uh, than anything if we speak about the growing inequalities and the social tensions that come with this. So predictability is important for everybody. Um, now, by, by way of closing, let me just come back to what I said in the beginning. Poor governance and poverty, social exclusions are the key drivers of, of uh, climate change. We have to address the roots and address them simultaneously with our investments in, in green economy to mitigate the negative spillovers of green transition, but also to make sure that we build back better and that we actually address some of the deficiencies that existed before COVID and that have been so keenly aggravated um, or so sharply aggravated in, in, in the course of the last year. Thank you. So Jana, I think there are at least three learnings that I take away with being somebody who advises both corporates and public policy institutions. My first key takeaway is, and I refer to Martin Jäger, that regulation is key. Regulation is certainly key. And the, I, I, I very rarely had a panel where both public and private uh, uh, distinguished colleagues would say, we need a strong regulation and we need, secondly, predictability. Predictability is absolutely key for investments. If you listen carefully to the, for example, European industry looking at the Green Deal and what that means, they ask for predictability for their investments in this cycle of investment that is coming upon now. Thirdly, cooperation. And I think this is an example for a well-functioning uh, platform where corporate, uh, private and uh, state and multilateral actors can work together to develop innovative solutions. And this is uh, some, uh, this I finish and close and thank for particularly all, th all four panelists here, but in particular, of course, Mariana, my kind of co-host, the administrator was earlier with us today on this uh, endeavor that we're doing here um, 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 together, UNDP and EY. Thank you very much for a fruitful discussion. Thank you for all your, for all your thoughts, for the good discussion that we had here and have a great day. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after this great panel, I have the privilege now to hand it over to my co-moderator, Nadim, who will lead us through the next two hours. Thank you very much. And Nadim, over to you. Thank you very much, Bernhard, for the moderation of this panel on policy innovation and the green transformation. It was great to hear from representatives of both the public and the private sector on policy level challenges and efforts to tackle the climate challenge. Next, we're still talking innovation, and that has to go hand in hand with policy innovation. We're talking about the role of digital transformation and technological innovations in tackling that massive challenge. My name is Nadim Shuker. I'm the founder of 2030 Cabinet, and I'm on a mission to accelerate progress towards the 2030 agenda through partnerships. We're going to hear from circular economy and natural capital experts, as well as youth change makers in these upcoming panels. So stick around. How should our economy be adapting to the green transformation? What to make of futuristic and innovative approaches to tackle the climate crisis in the current economic climate? Dr. Stefan Ramesol co-leads the research unit on digital transformation, focusing on circular economy, at the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy. Stefan joins us from Cologne. And Alan Laubsch is the CEO of Generation Blue. He's an expert on the topic of natural capital Alan joins us from Lisbon. Thank you both for joining us. Can I perhaps ask you to start us off with a short two minutes introduction on your work in this field, um, starting perhaps with Stefan. Thanks, Nadim. Yes, um, the Wuppertal Institute, since 30 years now, working on the sustainability transition. And uh, I think all together we are facing maybe the most decisive decade of human mankind because we have to set the direction to, to enter a sustainability pathways, and the challenges are enormous. Um, industry transformation is part of this. Um, our work on the digital transformation is embedded in the context of the circular economy, because our way how industry is organized has to change, has to change dramatically. It's no longer sufficient to make things better, to introduce better processes, better machines, better technologies. We have to make things different. 
in terms of decarbonization, climate change, uh, the momentum is already there. That's good. So decarbonizing industry, having a CO2 free steel making is now at discussion. However, we have to reach the next level. This means we have to enter a resource efficient economy. We have to tackle the material flows, the resource flows. We have to tackle the metabolism of industries. And this leads us to the circular economy as the new target picture. And circular economy as a concept is quite simple and builds on, uh, in the end, common sense, often denominated as the five R's. Rethink business models, putting services in front rather than consuming, uh, pay per use models, for example. Reduce the material content of services. Prolong lifetime, meaning repair, remanufacturing. So use resources, use products, use materials better and longer. And only then at the very end of the life stage, you enter the recycling phase in recovering those uh, technologies. So the circular economy is a system change, is a paradigm change. It is a completely new way to think industry. And in the end, digital tools are pivotal, are key to success in that transformation. And that's exactly what we're working on. And I think we'll discuss this a bit further in the next minutes. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Stefan. Alan. Thanks, Nadim. Um, so my, um, my work is around uh, earth positive economics. So the question is, how can we shift to an economy which makes the earth better, right? And it's really rooted in ancient wisdom. Uh, when a father says, I'd like to leave a world that's better for my children and all other children. Um, and how we do that is by enabling us to measure what our environmental footprint is, what is our impact, and then having a handprint that's bigger than the impact, right? So this is um, the overall approach anchored on ancient wisdom. My focus is really around how can we change the financial systems in order to accommodate that? So how can we enable anyone, any company, any organization to become earth positive immediately, for example, by making investments in natural capital? Right, so the uh, shift that we need is much for much more than going carbon neutral. It actually requires us to invest in the protection and regeneration of nature upfront. Um, it's really great to get these commitments to 2040, 2050, um, but what we need to do right now is stimulate the investment right now to make that tipping point happen. So can we create? natural capital as an asset class that's investable, that enables us to create the kind of flows that we need to regenerate the planet. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Alan. I mean, it's clear from both of what you said, digital transformation is one of the drivers of impact for a more sustainable economy. This is key in each of the work that you are both doing. You know, I take notes of changing the financial system, perhaps to change the metabolism of industry, as you, as you mentioned, uh, um, Stefan. Uh, very much interested in, in digging deeper, deeper into those topics. Um, on a general question, just to start with, uh, maybe with Stefan as well, you know, how, let's, let's get more into details perhaps. How can digital transformation really drive the shift to a circular economy? Can you give us a few examples of that? Uh, yes, as I said, the circular economy is a new approach, is a, a paradigm shift. Because usually in the traditional linear value chain, as a producer, you buy something, you do something with it, you sell it, and it's a fire and forget relation. You get your cash back and then the thing is gone. In a circular economy, we want to close material flows. So each step is interconnected and decisions that are taken, for example, in product design, severely impact the, reparabil uh, the ability to repair a product, to use it or even to recycle it. So roles and responsibilities do change in the circular economy. Things are interconnected, interdependent, and I have a different responsibility. In order to come there, of course, I have to find new solutions. And here digital technologies kick in. For example, if I do not sell material, but I sell a service, pay-per-use models, for example, digital tools like platforms uh, uh, have a service, if I want to prolong lifetime, predictive maintenance, sensors uh, uh, do, do benefits, I have different ways of repair, manufacturing tools that support this. And even the end, the recycling will benefit from tracking and tracing. You know, there's the very uh, <laughs> simple saying that waste is nothing but a valuable resource that had, has lost its information. So we have to put back the information 
to the resource, meaning we have to put information to material flows in order to be better, uh, to be able to recycle it better. All this together, this metabolism has to come to system solution. The actors have to interact and therefore in the end, the precondition is to have the information at hand. The system has to be understood. My role, my impacts have to be understood. I have to get the feedback as an information. And therefore, at the various points, single points, we have digital solutions. But for me, change will come if we have a overall transparency. Will depend on transparency. And therefore, I see a great potential in concepts like the digital product passport or electric product passport, however you call it, so that you have a kind of digital twin with the whole history, the lifetime, a kind of CV of any product is captured and we can make decisions by knowing what has happened. And this then gives us completely new opportunities to design, to decide, and in the end to invest. And that links into the sphere of Allen that the financial market is more and more demanding these information and will be more and be capable to direct investment capital into those assets that have a better track record. So information, transparency across the whole value chain is the prerequisite for proper investing and thereby leveraging the financial market. And this is something uh, where digital transformation for me is so important and really key to success. I really want to pick on the point that you mentioned around um, waste is is uh, just a resource with lost information because uh, you know perhaps we're going to talk about this a bit further but how does that information help in finding a leverage that impacts um, design decisions you know right from the outset and i think perhaps alan can, can say a few words about this but uh, um, before that uh, maybe alan also for you that similar question so how can you elaborate on the potential of digital transformation on delivering impact at scale in this world of natural capital where, where you work Sure. Um, I think that uh, the the example of Bitcoin is a very interesting, concrete one. Um, I've always been fascinated by what if we had a Bitcoin that actually was backed by regeneration, right? Bitcoin now, since I've followed it, um, has a uh, has you know reached a market capitalization um, of uh, around a trillion dollars, uh, spawning you know um, all these different uh, assets. And what's extraordinary about that is that it created an incentive for people to actually mine um, these coins. What if we had an incentive to regenerate, right? So just like we've had um, teams of engineers coming together to come up with um, efficient ways to mine Bitcoin, what if we had teams of uh, engineers coming together to figure out how to uh, better protect and regenerate the most vital ecosystems in the world uh, and therefore uh, earn uh, anti-mining coins um, that would be rewarded to all the stakeholders, including local communities, tribes that have uh, protected most of the world's biodiversity. So that's one example that I think is very, very powerful. Um, the concept for ecosystem payment for ecosystem services is incredibly effective as, for example, Costa Rica has shown, which went from being one of the most deforested places to, to reforesting because of these incentives. Um, but what has made that more difficult is the bureaucracy. What if we had a simple system that enabled everyone, even small stakeholders, to do this? Um, it's not science fiction anymore. Regen Network has come up with uh, ecological state protocols, including soil carbon sequestration estimates by pixel using the Sentinel-2 data from Europe. Um, it's free data, so with every update, uh, they can estimate the farmer's impact on soil carbon sequestration. Um, it's an absolute game changer. Um, the fit is extremely high, and in fact, that Carbon Plus token has now been launched. Um, Microsoft is the first major client and has supported uh, the purchase of these credits for a farm. And just word of mouth, um, over the last two months, uh, more than 200 farmers representing uh, more than a million acres of land have signed up to the platform. So that kind of shows you how these incentives uh, matter. And if you allow people to actually benefit from doing the right thing, if that can actually feed them, uh, then that becomes the game changer that we need. 
as opposed to in the existing carbon world, where I have some experience with a mangrove project, where it took more than five years before the project was able to even sell carbon credits, despite being such a great project that many corporations wanted to um, support that. Um, not to mention hundreds of thousands of dollars in certification and audit costs um, uh, and um, uh, you know, many, many people working on this. So what we need is game changers in verification and measurement and monitoring that enable this to happen automatically because if, if a small mangrove project takes five years to, um, to basically get some cash flow, uh, and we really want to scale, let's say, the voluntary carbon market uh, to where it needs to go, um, it's about one half percent of global emissions today. It needs to go to about 55% for us to meet the Paris targets. We need quantum change. We need something that's an order of magnitude better. And we need to shift from these 1980s style bureaucracies with a lot of inefficiencies that are centralized to systems that are science-based and data-powered, where we have satellite information that verifies the impact, that immediately triggers a token to be sent to all the key stakeholders from local communities to national governments to investors who are actually making uh, this happen. Game changers, from what I understand from you, cannot be a single you know, entity or a single approach. This is a systems approach that's needed, perhaps requiring um, all of government, all of society as we know, but in, the, in these specific things, um, you know, you mentioned multiple times bureaucracy. Before we get into, into that aspect a bit more, um, I'd like to just, you know, maybe focus a bit on how your work is actually interlinked. It's very interesting how you mentioned uh, um, uh, some of the data related, uh, um, you know, let's say transformations. Uh, enabled by digital transformation, so information that allows you to uh, quantify properly, measure, uh, and therefore allows you to uh, um, to work efficiently with with natural capital as a means uh, um, to create this green transformation. Um, on your end, um, Stefan, you you mentioned this this information at each uh, stage, or you call it product passport. So I really would like to see how how could your work interlink in terms of you know uh, um, the financial incentives coming in perhaps to change. Design, deci design decisions uh, for, for a few products. Uh, the first remark is a kind of disclaimer. Uh, of course, when talking about the opportunities, we have to be aware that digital te technologies as such have a footprint as well. So the same requirements apply, apply, the same challenges apply. And of course, we have to consider the energy consumption, the resource consumption for digital solutions, be it our hardware, be it our infrastructures, data centers, or digital solutions like the Bitcoin, which come with a certain computation challenge. This does not put them into question. It's simply the task, of course, to organize the digital world the same way, in a circular way, reduce the uh, uh, resource use, recycle the material, uh, put renewable energies into operation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's very important to understand the digital world is not virtual. There is a physical footprint behind, which is an action field in its own. I think that's important. It's a base layer. We do not need to expand on this, but it's important to keep this always in mind. Green digital is a precondition to leverage the benefit. Second remark, and I think that's the joint between the two worlds of us. I think we have um, uh, disguised or let's say distracted ourselves by this technicality term of externalities. I mean, there is the real stuff where the business is done, where the profit is made, the, the things that count, and then there are these externalities, which are there, but they're not uh, in the accounts because they're so complicated or whatsoever. But these externalities are key. These are physical, these are driving the world. And then you have the theoretical strand of pricing, externalities, blah, blah, blah. In the end, it's the result of either pure cynical ignorance or laziness to have these cost items not in the bill. And I think that's exactly what we are talking about. Alan is talking about cost, putting cost items and putting value items into the bill to have a more comprehensive bill of nature. And the same for the circular economy. If I produce a plastic packaging of eight different material layers in order to preserve a cheese to live for 20 years without rotting, 
no customer buying a cheese which is 10 years old and still good for another 10 years, meaning this high-tech layer foil is completely useless, but practically not possible to recycle. Therefore, the cost of producing such a thing are not incorporated in the cost of the plastic packaging. So the same thing, we have to link causalities, we have to link the, the monetary system and thereby have to link opportunities and responsibilities. It's a very basic principle and now we have different ways to organize this. We don't have much time left. I uh, would have loved to d dig deeper into that specific point um, on mindset, but what I would like to, um, you know, sort of close it off in a loop and stay circular. We, we spoke of, of digital transformation, uh, systems change. Maybe we, you know, should speak a bit about enabling policies perhaps, or the lack thereof in some cases. Um, what needs to change? What should happen in terms of uh, the policy aspect of things so that what you are talking about is actually possible um, and leads to impact faster at a larger scale? I'd like to make a comment around uh, policies for the, for the carbon markets. I think it's incredibly important uh, for the uh, for us to go beyond the national boundary system where currently we have um, the example of, for example, Myanmar and mangroves or Indonesia or Philippines, where every ton of CO2 that's offset by these vital ecosystems has an extraordinary co-benefit in terms of biodiversity. You know, half the world's biodiversity is concentrated in some of these hotspots, and they're in the tropical forests that are most endangered with communities that are most impoverished as well. So we can have such a huge biodiversity, community co-benefit, as well as um, you know, have an impact that obviously is planetary in terms of water cycles and carbon. So moving these boundaries, uh, removing these, inter these, these trade boundaries and enabling really the investment into natural capital across boundaries to me is the single biggest uh, policy game changer and hopefully that will be um, addressed at the COP26. Thanks, Alan. Stefan? I absolutely agree. And I want to build on this to add to this. First of all, policy has to set the long-term targets. Markets are blind. Markets are incapable to uh, design future societal targets. That's simply not possible. So that long-term targets are with the socia uh, societal benefits. These targets have to be set by politics as a reliable framework where then markets and corporates can adapt to. And for example, the approach uh, Alan mentioned is such a long-term overarching framework set by politics. Number two, uh, no, uh, first thing, number two is indeed uh, the simple thing, let prices tell the truth. And that means politics have to work on transparency and uh, incorporate uh, the cost of uh, uh, these uh, life cycles and this is something where documentation transparency regulation can yeah improve the knowledge can improve the insight and thereby can uh, enlarge the opportunities to decide the better way thank you both very much you know we talked about um, earth positive economics the need for a system and paradigm change paradigm shift um, we need to change the metabolism of industry. We have at our disposal um, amazing tools from a digital per perspective and new technologies that will allow this. We need policy to step it up and sort of set that general direction. Um, hopefully with same things like the EU Green Deal, uh, mission-based approaches to research and innovation, uh, you know, feeding back into uh, uh, going for that paradigm shift. Um, very, very informative session. Thank you both for your time. It's been a pleasure. Now let's switch gears with a bit of a generational shift. We live with social and economic inequalities of an unprecedented scale. Interlinked climate ecological and health crisis disproportionately affecting the poorest and most marginalized in our communities and across the globe. Now, more than ever, we need collective, bold, transformative actions that match the scale of the global challenges that we face. 
you've probably already heard the shouts for system change. But what exactly does this mean? And how do we get there? We need to understand that the only way this change will happen is by realizing who has the greatest potential to initiate it. It is us, the people, each and every one of us, together. And when we say together, we mean everyone. We need to be creating collaborations and alliances, a movement of movements which understands that all the crises are interconnected and need to be tackled at their root. For just and sustainable societies, we must build a collective vision that centers the voices of the deliberately silenced, the individuals and communities that are most affected, especially in times of crisis. There is a long road ahead of us. This is the fight for our lives and livelihoods. Through an intersectional approach to movement building, we at Collective Z are tackling social and environmental challenges by creating platforms for joint visioning and collective transformative actions. Our young, women-led initiative was brought to life by the drive to bring the needed change to our communities in North Macedonia. We believe that we need a strong, united front with a radical vision of the future, rooted in solidarity, justice and care for our communities and our environment. That is why we're deeply committed to facilitating the creation of a national and Balkan Green Deal as a pathway to reaching a just and sustainable society we collectively envisage. We must nurture and foster the power of the people to mobilize, unite and transform their communities and their regions for the better. We know that a just world of joint dreams and public abundances on a healthy planet is possible and worth fighting for. The time to create it together is now. Start initiating the change in your community. What does the new future global order hold and imply for generations to come, like Generation Z? And what is the role of this generation? It is a question we're going to explore with Anna and Sofia from Collective Z, a young, woman-led collective based in North Macedonia. They're dedicated to building people power for intersectional, transformative actions to improve the well-being of their communities and the planet. Sofia and Anna are activists, trainers, facilitators, speakers, and coordinators at Collective Z. They're both passionate about incorporating intersectionality and collective visioning approaches for building a collective response and impactful solutions to the environmental, economic, structural, and political struggles we face today. They're working at the intersection of climate and social justice. Welcome to you both. So I must have said the word collective about eight times in this introduction. Along with intersectionality, these are two key words in your mission. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Firstly, thank you very much for inviting us to join this session. It's our pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so the key approach of our organization for climate and social justice, Collective Z, is intersectionality, pointing out and understanding how different forms of systemic injustices and oppressions intersect and allow the power structures to often operate in a complex and cumulative way. We use this as our approach to act towards system change and social, social justice. For implementing intersectionality and practice, we apply the collective visioning method for creating solutions, actions, and even the movement itself, which is an important value for us, also represented in our name, Collective Z. We believe that in order for us to change the system, there has to be an act of togetherness, envisioning what we want our system to be, and then co-creating it together with every community. Many people we met on our journey were surprised by our collective approach because in the current system that we live, we're not asked how we want our surroundings and society to look like, and we're not invited to have an equal say in policy creation. We're used to seeing uh, defined programs with ambitious goals, with um, unlike the courage to build a holistic movement together with a collective vision for the better of the society and everyone in it, including all living beings and the planet. 
it is a challenging idea that we took upon, but considering where we are now in the climate, social and health crisis, it was the only thing that made sense for us to devote our lives to. This is why, with our work, we are building a movement to tackle the social and environmental struggles by creating platforms for collective transformative actions and joint efforts driven by our values as a humanity and not from positions of power. So why did you choose to focus your effort on Generation Z? So carrying out all, all of the current, past and future generation struggles, the role of the Generation Z is pivotal. We're the generation that has the biggest mission in front of us, concerned of our existence endangered by climate crisis, long history of social struggles and nowadays a health crisis. We may be able to witness it more and some less, depending on, on many geographical or class status, but this is a burden that older generations have put to younger ones, and we have no choice but to act upon it. So through global digitalization, our generation is uncovering all of the structural injustices happening from broken systems of oppression, increasing inequalities on every aspect of our society to global warming and man-made disruption of our ecosystem. So listening to the voices of young people and underrepresented communities is important and has to be done for the benefit of the whole society. Uh, in this way, we can learn the true challenges and visions that are different from our own and see potential solutions from perspectives that are not biased. And why is that? Because these people, especially young people, are active from their hearts, driven to create better societies for all. Your whole generation was very active at a global level, but I also know that you both worked at a European level. You were also involved in creating a region-wide Green Deal and you work locally with communities and on the ground. How different are those approaches at each of these levels? Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to say as well, thank you for having us and giving your platform uh, to share our story. Uh, regarding your question, uh, behind our approaches of tackling the systemic inequalities and the system crisis, whether it's an EU, regional or local level, our approaches are changing according to the principles that we work on. So addressing the common but differentiated responsibilities, being aware of the historic responsibilities, and of course the inter intersectionality and collective community creation. So these principles are explaining that not everyone is experiencing the same and is equally responsible for the climate crisis and the broken system, so we act accordingly. For instance, on EU level, uh, we approach as calling out on the current established power system and making sure that we are introspective about whose voices need to be emphasized. We are doing this uh, together with Young Friends of the Earth European Network by creating Pan-European Green Deal. On the other hand, we approach the regional level by joint cooperations with the other Balkan countries uh, to map allyships and map struggles, to share practices, learn from each other, so we can all uh, later on act on our national and local levels where the true change can be made and the true change can be transformed. For example, uh, we are doing this uh, by creating the Balkan Green Deal Coalition um, and, and together we co-created the Balkan Green Deal and the principal, principles for green and just recovery from this uh, pandemic. Uh, on the national level, uh, we work on creating a collective vision that centers the voices of the grassroots struggles. Because it's time to bring the decision making for our societies and our communities back to the hands of the people that actually live in those communities. People that know the resources, the nature, the land around them the best. So um, uh, something like public ownership of the commons, something that people will govern together democratically. Um, also, on a national level, our approach is to build bridges with the respective institutions in order to have a participatory decision-making process with foundations, including people's visions of their communities. I can share an example of such cooperation that we are doing is we signed a memorandum with the Ministry of Environment and Physical Planning in uh, North Macedonia, in our country, 
and uh, we introduced them to our digital participatory platform Zelen Glass in English Green Voice that includes the collective visioning method that we are having in our work uh, as a way of connecting the people and the decision makers. It's clear that no matter the level at which you're trying to operate, um, you have a massive job of trying to bring multiple stakeholders together. So let's zoom in a bit on this challenge of, of getting you know, all of these stakeholders involved and managing this interaction. Um, what are the barriers to doing that? And how different also are the barriers on, let's say, local level versus on the Balkan uh, Green Deal approach? Okay, uh, yes, uh, we have um, uh, faced a lot of challenges. And the main that I can say is um, uh, it was uh, kind of, you know, like strange at the start to inspire collective movement in uh, countries that are developing countries such as ours, especially when hit by the pandemic. Uh, because there are whole communities that have not even the basic human needs uh, being met. For instance, uh, decent homes for a living, sufficient income, uh, workers' rights, access to clean water, affordable and clean electricity. So uh, the barriers, I can say both on national and regional level, is that until now we have been all fighting our own small battles and we have been used to doing this because let's uh, think about it um, it's so much easier to continue fighting the small individual fights uh, and still let the power structure of our systems to continue control the commons to control to continue control the earth's limited resources and disrupt our ecosystems to continue with the current economic model of unlimited consumption on a limited planet. And that's why we need to urgently start taking them into account and plan for, the, for our history um, and for the development and its future, as is the topic of this conference today. So uh, also, in creating these coalitions, it has been a challenge to include everyone from different sectors on board uh, but we keep on working on it, uh, on this together, because uh, we see it as a start towards building uh, more just societies. Um, as, as last, uh, as a main challenge in our work, uh, um, we need to stop laying out the foundations of our decision-making processes um, uh, on what is politically possible, but we need to start deciding on what is desperately needed to be done. Only like this, we can together build the foundations of a better, more just and inclusive countries and just system of functioning. Thank you very much for this. I think it's a, it's a great lesson in reflection um, uh, for everyone to you know, sort of understand the approaches related to prioritization of issues that need, need to be tackled, which then guides which stakeholders you start interacting with. Um, bringing all of these, stake these stakeholders to the table is, is you know, part of your mission to basically bring about systems change. Um, that's easier said than done in most of these cases, but your generation are really a driving force behind the push for systems change. Can you give us a, a couple of practical examples, perhaps, of how you do that within your collective? Exactly. Uh, Gen Z, our generation, has the tools and the true power for system change. And we have been doing this, creating a transformative movement with the collective visioning method on our digital participatory platform, Zelen Glass, that I mentioned before. Uh, and we have been doing this through different meetings, events, workshops, trainings, and of course, the social media is a very powerful tool. Uh, where together with our co-workers, with, uh, with our allies, with communities, we are collectively visioning for our society and create common values and uh, collective visions for building back better. Because it's time for our generation, the young people, to break the pattern. So that's what we are trying to do and that's what we are doing. Uh, we are starting to see ourselves as powerful social actors building um, more just societies on a daily basis. Um, and an example that I want to share uh, of a good practice is uh, we collectively need to work um, 
on uh, and taking into consideration where our countries are at the moment and where they want to go, where, where they are transitioning to go. Uh, the idea is less likely here is one model for everyone to copy, uh, for every country to copy and function like that. Uh, and the idea is more likely uh, what is kind of, you know, a multilateral framework guided by principles where governments, civil societies and all the people come together to work out what actually their communities uh, and their society need. Um, also, Anna, if you would like to share something on this question, please go on. Yes, thank you, Sofia. I would just like to add that we are proud to be the young people that started and initiated the power of collective creation and visioning in our country. But everyone can do that at their local level. All you need is the values and, and that drive you and the passion for a better, just world. And for those who are inspired to learn more from our story and act as in their society, please do reach us out. Contact us at collectivez.mk and we'll be happy to collaborate, share practices and our experience. Thank you very much to both of you. I could really end by saying ignore the youth and the new generations at your peril, but in fact, ignoring them is really at their peril. And this is very much why they're not sitting idle. They're mobilizing uh, visibly on Fridays before the pandemic, but very much on the ground with their communities behind the scenes every day, um, being very much aware of issues of intersectionality, approaches that require collective action and the need for systems and mindset change for building a new economy. Thank you very much to both of you and good luck. This marks the end of our Berlin session. Thank you, Bernard, for hosting the session today. It was great to hear from different perspectives on innovation and policymaking. Also, a very warm thank you to our audience for joining the first of our, of our three collaborative EY and UNDP sessions. On behalf of UNDP and EY, I would also like to thank our speakers and panelists of today. There was a great diversity in the session in Berlin, representatives from all three sectors and all generations, from government, private sector, and also the third sector. It was great to also hear from Gen Z, which is the, gen the generation that will be responsible for policy innovation happening now and who are exerting an ever stronger influence on our green transformation. We would very much like to also invite you to join the session tomorrow from Dubai on the future of knowledge that will be opened by Julie Lynn Tagland, the EY EMEA lead, and Khaled Abdushafi, UNDP director of the regional hub in Amman. Here, questions about the future of knowledge for resilience will be tackled. It's a really important question in the light of the pandemic and how our approach to emerging risks should change. The last event of our future framing sessions is on the 18th of March from San Francisco. And this will explore technology partnerships as a blueprint for greener and more inclusive economies. This last session will be opened by Adlai Goldberg, an EY partner in San Francisco on global innovation, and Robert Opp, Chief Digital Officer at UNDP. The session will build on some of the themes that we handled here today and look at the role of technology and collaborations to be played. We look forward to more fruitful discussions in the coming days. Please join us at any of these sessions by following the link we're going to share here. Thank you very much for watching. Mm -hmm.